Welcome to Film in Focus. I am the cinema professor. We have a special guest this week, quite a familiar guest, back once again with a vengeance. That is Ray Turner. Good Hello. evening, Ray. Hello. Thanks for coming. But Ray's back to talk about his silent film club. So, Ray, I guess we'll start with the basics. Just describe roughly what it is. What it is. Um, it, it's, a, it's a place, it's the Gregson, and you go there and watch silent movies. Um, once a month with a bunch of people who are into silent movies. Enthusiastic. Um, <laughs> so how long has it been going and what made you want to start it, essentially? Um, it's been going nearly four years now. It'll be, I think, four years in the summer. Um, what made me start it was um, actually kind of by accident, really. It was uh, I was just chatting to a friend in a pub and we were talking about music. And um, Okay. And as always with me, whatever discussion we have ends up going back to films. But um, no, he he was talking about Tangerine Dream and saying that one of the things he really loved about them was that they um, they would do sort of effects and stuff that people can now do very easily on their computers or on their phone or whatever. But when they did them, they would have taken you know weeks of work and sort of played around with all sorts of weird and wonderful gadgets and stuff. And he just happened to say, is there a film equivalent of that? And, and I mentioned Sunrise, which is a silent movie, mm. a Murnau silent movie from the 27, I think it is. And, um, I mean, it's amazing when you watch that film that, you know, the camera is so fluid and so mobile and sort of just going, you know, over, over sort of bridges and, you know, across barriers and over walls and things like that. And they did this with, you know, great big heavy hand, I don't know, they weren't, well, they might have been hand-cranked, yeah, cameras. And um, mm. and I sort of said, well, you know, that is something that, I mean, A, I love the film anyway, but, but when I watch that, part of the thing that I enjoy is thinking, my God, how did they do that back then? You know, it's like, they didn't have drones or anything, you know, they, did, they just did that. And so we talked about that a bit, and then it was just sort of like, oh, let's watch it. And I think... You know, me being me, I didn't <laughs> so I thought, let's let's not just have a little video night at my house. That would be boring. So mm. I thought let's let's hire the Gregson and get a few friends in and um show it properly. Okay. Like the way it deserves to be seen, I think, at least somewhat, you know, with an audience and <clears throat> excuse me. And uh and with with people appreciating it and on a slightly bigger screen and that sort of thing. And so we did it and we watched this film and it was great. And just kind of thought, I wonder if anyone would like to do this again. Um, and and it turned out that pretty much everyone that was there did want to do it again. Um, so we we made it a regular monthly thing. And I mean, the, the fact that we're still going is quite staggering, really, yeah. because, you know, I, you, you wouldn't think there was kind of an appetite for silent movies, really. But there apparently is. I mean, people do seem to enjoy them. People come along. Um, not really knowing what to expect, and they kind of get sucked into it. I think, and they kind of, they kind of get you know won over by these by these like wonderful works of art, really. Mm. Okay. So that's how it started, and yeah, nearly four years now. It'll be four years in the oh. summer. And what was the first screening? Sunrise. Sunrise. Was, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, I mean, we've we, we've shown. I mean, now we've kind of shown most of the really famous films. Um, and so we're kind of getting into the point where we're starting to see films that are less famous. So, mm. um, so here's the plug. If anyone wants to come along, obviously you are more than welcome. And we, we actually would, would beg you to come along. We desperately mm. need as many people as possible. Um, but it's, it's like we are actually now at a point where we're not, we're not just watching all the usual sort of stuff that, you know, I mean, anyone who knows anything at all about silent movies and sort of knows Metropolis and mm. and maybe Sunrise and, um, I don't know, Nostratu. Yeah. Maybe Birth of a Nation, those kind of films. Um, but we've kind of, we've shown all them now, and Battleship Potemkin, those kind of things, we've shown all them, and now we're kind of okay. going on to films. And we've actually, this, this year, we've planned out for the year, and actually there's only two of the films um, that I've actually seen out of all, all the films we're showing this year. Um, so most of them I don't know anything about, really, which is quite... So it's quite exciting for me, really, because, you know, finally getting to see some new films. 
And do you find that the crowd that typically come along, do you find that they're sort of a film sort of crowd, or is there a mixture, or is there, like, new sort of people who maybe don't know these? Um, yeah. Yeah, no, not really. Um, I mean, I think I think one or two people have discovered silent movies through coming along, mm. um, and that's, you know, brilliant. Um, there's There's one guy... Um, in the group who is the real kind of movie buff, a real silent movie buff, I should say. And he, he's he's the guy who's got 90% of the films that we end up showing. OK. Um, and he just kind of knows everything there is to know about silent movies. But even even we've even found one that he'd never heard of, actually, <laughs> and we're showing it this year, hopefully, if we can get hold of a copy. Um, and um, but, but, yeah, no, most of the people that come just kind of like the idea, thought that would be interesting, um, something to do. And some people come and don't come back, but actually most of the people that do uh, do come back and seem to seem to. We've kind of been a loyal. I mean, I think this is why we've stayed mm. stayed going really because we've we've barely scraped even. I mean, we've, we you know right. we do have to pay for the Gregson, um, and we don't exactly charge people to come. We sort of ask for a donation, so mm. it's pay what you want. Yeah, suggested um, donations. Yeah, and you don't right. have to pay if you don't want to. And we don't actually keep tabs on what people do and don't pay, so we don't know if like, people pay or not. Um, OK. Because, because apart from anything else, you know, even if people come and don't pay, it's, it's, it, it, these films work better with an audience. And I think any films work better with an audience, but hmm. I think these films in particular, they're not made, they're not made in the video age. You know, they're, they're, they're made very much in the age when people went to the cinema to see films, so... That's that's what they're that's how they work best, I think. Great. In, in a crowd. And are there particular screenings that have stood out to you as memorable for particular reasons or Um I mean there's obviously there's a couple of times that we've seen something that I've just wanted to see for years and years and years. Um Denibelungen is one, which is a Fritz Lang movie. Fritz Lang f- directed Metropolis mm. and Went to uh, went to America, um, fled the Nazis. Really, went to America. Um, smart man. Smart man. Although uh, D- 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 and apparently, I, I, I think was Hitler's favourite movie. <laughs> Has that weird distinction of being because it's a very patriotic German film. But yeah. This is Post Second World War, pre pre Nazis. Okay. So it was so it making a patriotic German movie at that time had a different connotation to what it would have had 10 years later. Interesting. Um, yeah. And I, okay. So, I mean, I mean, this was a, I mean, this is the kind of Wagner, you know, Rheingold story. Okay. But Fritz Lang made it into a movie, which was long. So it was over two nights. It was, uh, it's nearly five hours long. So we did it, sure. we did it like a week in between. Um, so that was brilliant because I'd never seen that before. Okay. Um, and I'd been wanting to. And, Another one that really stood out was um, uh, um, I've forgotten D.W. Griffith's movie um, called I've forgotten what it's called <laughs> called um, <laughs> My Mind Has Gone Blank it's um, uh, I've actually Is forgotten uh, Insignificance uh, uh, No, you're thinking of Intolerance it's not it okay. wasn't that no, it's um, it's um, <laughs> it has actually gone I cannot remember the title of the film um, it's I, set in London, and okay. it's, it's about a, a, it's kind of a sort of Romeo and Juliet type thing. But it's um, I mean, D. W. Griffiths obviously most famously made Birth of a Nation. It'll yeah. come back to me in the middle of this sentence. I'll suddenly remember the title of this film. It's Broken Blossoms. That's the title of the film. Oh, okay, Broken Blossoms, and uh, and and that, it was amazing because I'd seen it before and sort of hadn't particularly loved it. I just kind of enjoyed it and um, and watched it with this group, and it was like. It was just an amazing, very, very moving experience. It's and it's it's a real kind of anti-racist. It's a love story against uh, about um, you know an English girl in Limehouse living in poverty in mm-hmm. Limehouse. <laughs> Not the case anymore. But um, and and she falls in love with a Chinese kind of merchant that's who's sort of a drug addict, and it's all quite sort of. Um, and you know her dad has other ideas and sort of you know um, and yeah that one it was it was a real surprise because it was a sort of I sort of it felt like I'd seen it for the first time this, this time 
Um, and, you know, it, it almost impressed me enough that I could almost remember the title. You, you have touched on something interesting with that because I, I know it's slightly off topic, but, of course, my experience with him was Birth of the Nation, which is famously... Yeah. I've, there's little doubt it's it's basically race, racist. Oh, it's horrendously racist. Um, it's, um, and yet you've described that film as being anti-racist. So that's quite interesting how the same person who made Birth of the Nation could make something like that. So I guess my question is, do you... Fi- well, partly, I guess, to do with that, but also... Because Birth of Nation, I mean, it's obviously a very long film, so because of the content, I had to watch it in two or three sittings. But it's also interesting. Do you think he's like he gains respect because of historical reasons, or because he was a good filmmaker despite the fact that? Yeah, I think he you was know his sort of yeah. I think he was a good filmmaker despite his whatever his political re- leanings were, and I don't really know what they are. Yeah. I don't want to defend Birth of a Nation um, because, you know, because he's a great filmmaker, therefore he can't be a racist. Um, it, it is horrendously racist. Yeah. Um, and, I, I mean, when I first saw it, despite knowing it was horrendously racist, I was shocked at how racist it was. And, mm. and perhaps we should tell people, I mean, is it because they may not know? Yeah. This is a film where the Ku Klux Klan are the heroes. Um and uh, and characters black and, up and, basically. Yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah. the people in blackface is the least offensive thing about it, really. Um, it's it's really terrible, and, and we've not shown that film. We kind of we kind of keep thinking maybe we should because it's part of the you know. And it's a really in terms of film history, it's a massively important film. It really is the film that started Hollywood. Really, I mean, you know, it made so much money because it was so popular. Um, and it cost a lot, didn't it, for the era? I, I think, think at the time. I think it did cost a lot, but it certainly made it back. Made I mean, it, it back. I mean, it made yeah. it. I mean, but but it also, you know, the, the 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 very very big downside of it is the Ku Klux Klan were basically all but gone. They they were finished, mm. and this revived it because it revived interest because it was so popular and and so you know. <laughs> Try and look at it from a different point of view. <laughs> I'm digging a hole for myself. <laughs> <laughs> I try and look at it from a different point of view, um, which is just the power of the filmmaking. Um, and it, it was an amazingly powerful piece of filmmaking, you know, and, and people were moved by it, you know, for all the wrong reasons. And, you know, mm. um, and, uh, and, but, you know, yeah, the real downside of it is it, it revived the Ku Klux Klan, um, mm. and they are still going strong. <laughs> OK, so. well, you can blame that on me, folks, because I took us down that particular path, but <laughs> thanks but for that. I, my, my, take on, <laughs> my take on Griffith, so I think, you yeah. know, is that... I mean, he was a southerner, um, so he, he... I think his father or his grandfather fought in the Civil War for the South. Um, but I think he was just... He just cared about stories, you know, Mm. which is why he can make a film that... He'd made anti-Ku Klux Klan films before, Birth of a Nation. And then he made suddenly made a pro one, and then he made a sort of anti-race. And I don't think he cared, you know, I don't think it was an issue. I think he just kind of went, this is a good story, I'll make this film. Okay, That's my take on it, but I don't really know. Um, Okay, Okay. thanks for that. But I wouldn't want to defend that film. (laughs) No, it's an interesting perspective on it. Thank you. So, Ray, I was wondering, because obviously you still get modern filmmakers making silent films, Mm -hmm. um, obviously the artist, but also um, Guy Madden, the Canadian filmmaker, for example. Um, So what do you think about that stuff, and what do you think its place is? Do you think there's room for a revival, or are you happy for modern filmmakers to make silent movies? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm always happy for anyone to make silent movies um, or any movies, really. Um, uh, I, I think there's an appeal uh, with with um, any modern filmmaker because um, silent movies, are, you know, they're, they're they're visual. I mean, they're entirely visual, so they don't rely on on any. You can't use dialogue. I mean, you can use uh, title cards, but they tended not to very much. Mm. Um, so you've got to kind of tell the story through pictures and through 
sort of juxtaposing images and sort of putting, you know, this image with that image means means another thing, you know, and that sort of thing. Um, which is the sort of stuff filmmakers like, I think. It's what filmmakers do, isn't it? That, that, that's why they become filmmakers in the first place, mm. because they, they're interested in images. Um, so I think that that's probably the appeal. Whether or not I think... I can't imagine... You know, I think the artist... I mean, maybe to some extent the artist kind of explains the fact that it won the Oscar and was massively popular. Mm. Um, maybe explains why people, when they see an actual silent movie, kind of, you know, sort of uh, kind of understand what the appeal is because I think they do have a lot more power than than a lot of sound movies. Okay. Um, because I think you can... Well, I, I suppose the point is because it's stylized in the first place, it's, you know, by not having sound, I think you can sort of slightly push... The emotions a bit further, and you can you can push. It's not exactly the logic, but you can you can sort of you can you can just kind of exaggerate things a bit, and um, and and it's more of a kind of ride than sort of seeing something kind of you know sort of like a more realist type of film, you know. Okay. That's, so I think I think so. Whether or not I think, I, mean, I don't I don't you know I saw the artist, and I've seen a few of these other films that people have made. And I mean they're they're fine, you know they're perfectly good. Um, but I do wonder if if you know obviously the people that made films back then really had to be able to do that. They had to be able to tell stories visually. And I do wonder, you know, it's like filmmakers want to do it, but can they do it? Really? <laughs> you know what I mean? They've been relying on relying on dialogue and. I, I mean, I think that would be interesting to hear from like someone like Guy Madden, who obviously doesn't have to because now he's got the option of sound. And I mean, from the films I've seen of his, I really like his his work. But it is interesting whether he approaches it as someone who just has a fondness for silent movies, so wants to do it in that style, or whether well, obviously they, I think he must love them because pretty much all his films are silent, but. I have to confess, I don't know who Guy Madden is, I'm sorry. Um, like, the loudest music in the world, um, Dracula, Pages from a Virgin's Diary, a few different ones. Mm. My Winnipeg, I don't know if you heard of that. The, the, the first one you said was the, be the most beautiful music in the world. Uh, yes, yeah, so, loudest music loudest or something. Music. It had um, Isabel Rossellini in that. That's very, very that's, good film, yeah, I'm, actually. Yeah, that's ringing a bell, but... Um... Yeah. Yeah. I'm, okay. No. I no. Canadian director. Yeah, I haven't but seen Very any interesting. Well. Okay. And he makes silent movies. Doesn't yeah, he? he does. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and yeah. obviously he's a bit more art house, you know, because obviously with the artists and what have you. But mm. yeah, it's interesting in in a modern context how that is different from when people viewed them, where you didn't have you know the novelty of you know. Yeah, I mean, well, obviously anyone who I mean, like you know, anyone who shoots. A silent movie nowadays is doing it out of choice in the same way that if anyone shoots a black and white movie, you know, it's out of choice. Whereas mm. it, it wasn't the case back then. They didn't have any option. They they did have colour, but they, it was so expensive and it didn't, well, didn't look that good. Um, so yeah. I mean, they, they shot black and white and they didn't really have sound that could work. Um, so they shot silent. And but I think that, you know, and I mean, you know, obviously bad films were made, but mm. the, the films that have survived, and there's not that many of them really. I mean, they, you know, relatively speaking, a lot of them, because there's really old film stock that used to burn and deteriorate and everything. Mm. So many of the films are just gone. I mean, just forever. Mm. Um, so, I mean, so they've survived physically, but they've also sort of survived kind of emotionally as well. People have, People have kind of... Films like Metropolis, for example, people still watch that and are shocked at how amazing it is, I think. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a reason that they've survived all this time. I mean, like nearly 100 years, you know, sort of now. Um, because they're good. Um, I mean, there's not... You know, I mean, there's you think about movies in the 70s, for example, you think of Taxi Driver and Chinatown and a few films like that. Um... But there were hundreds of other films made that we don't remember anymore because they're no good. So, 
Um, you know, the, 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 there's the fact that people are remembering silent movies. The ones that we have at our disposal tend to be the good ones, I think. Um, yeah. Which is which is okay. which is you know good for a group like ours because means everything we watch is good, really. I, I suppose that's the balance, though. I think I think <coughs> I suppose if you make the opposing argument, because the conditions were what they were and people had to make silent movies, I suppose the opposing argument is. If they were good, that's partly through circumstance. I mean, obviously, I I'm playing devil's advocate. No, obviously, I mean, I, obviously, I realise people like Hitchcock and Lang worked in silent movies. They're very skilled filmmakers. Yeah, and I mean, I think that, that when you see Hitchcock's movies right up until the end, really, I mean, he he was using a lot of techniques that he had learned in in the. He made quite a few silent movies. I don't know how many, but mm. I mean, he made about eight or nine silent movies, I think. Um, and in fact, we watched one last month. That was a that was oh, yeah. film we yeah. watched was a Hitchcock movie. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, I think he learned a lot of techniques. And I think if you if you read the the Hitchcock Truffaut book, okay, uh, do you know the book? I'm, I I'm do. Really, yeah. but I've seen the documentary. Right. Um, I think he talks in that about you know how when sound came a lot of a lot of directors just kind of started filming people talking and he sort of said well there was no reason to drop the kind of visual storytelling that they'd all learn and he kind of consciously kept trying to tell stories visually mm. um so in terms of circumstance well I mean I think I think maybe but I I also think that they were they would I mean, on the one hand, the, the very early days of silent movie, they were they were actually discovering the art of filmmaking. You know, they were mm. they were discovering how to tell a story on film at all. I mean, the very very first films were just single shots because they didn't understand the idea of editing, and then they started editing in sort of weird and wonderful ways where you'd sort of see the action from like one place, where you'd see yeah. an exterior, and you'd sort of I mean, famous this is a film that everyone talks about is that there's a. I think it's called the Day in the Life of a, an American Fireman or something. Okay, and yeah, I've you, heard of that. Yeah, one. you see a yeah. fireman going in and out of a window, yeah, getting rescuing people, and then you cut to the inside, and you see it all again from the inside. <laughs> oh, sorry, uh, <laughs> getting overexcited and whacking my microphone. <laughs> um, but so, so you sort of see. So they started doing that, and eventually they kind of hit on this idea that you could just edit. You know, you could edit the way that we now edit today, and and that became the normal way to tell a story and um cool. so i mean you can if you watch enough of this stuff you can sort of see the art of cinema developing i suppose yeah um, yeah obviously it was quite an interesting beginning the early cinema because a lot of them were just like slices of life they called them and they yeah some of them promotional so and then eventually they move forward into more narrative type mm. films but and i mean you know the good the good directors the people who could do it sort of went on and had careers and they kind of they yeah. carried on making films into the sort of 20s and stuff and then obviously the late 20s sound came in mm. um, some of them carried on working and some didn't um, cool and also a lot of stars I mean they indeed a lot of stars didn't make the transition which is I guess what the artist is about isn't it really yeah um <coughs> excuse me Sorry. um yeah, um, and so a lot of really great actors, people like Garbo made the transition, but John Gilbert, who was Garbo's fiance, okay. didn't, and uh, his career went down the pan, and I don't think it was a happy ending for him. I think he was <laughs> turned into a bit of a drunk. But, um, yeah, um, but he was, I mean, you know, there were some very, very big stars. He was a huge, huge star, and he didn't manage to make it into silent movie, into sound movies. Okay. Um, because apparently he had a squeaky voice. <laughs> Don't know how true that is. Cool. So, do you want to promote a few of the upcoming films? Uh, yeah. Well, um, the the next one we've got is quite an interesting one because it's um, okay. a film called um, The Adventures of Prince Ahmed, um, which is the first. Uh, well, nobody's one hundred percent sure, but it's it's it could well be the very first animated feature film, and it's certainly the oldest surviving animated feature film, made by a German called Lottie okay. Reiniger, a German lady, 
And we're showing that as a double bill with the last performance, and that's on the 20th of March. The last performance is a, is a Conrad Veidt movie. Okay. Um, and he um, is better known for... He was in Casablanca and... <clears throat> excuse me. And um, the Cabinet of Dr Caligari and these other... Oh, OK, excellent. Um, and we do have a John Gilbert movie in November, The Big Parade, which was... OK. Which is a First World War movie, and we're showing that because of 100 years since the end of the First World War. Um, got a comedy in August, which is The Strong Man, which is directed by Frank Capra, who directed It's a Wonderful Life. OK. Um, and that's uh, Harry Langdon, who's a kind of forgotten mm. comedian, but he was kind of up there with Chaplin and Keaton and Harold Lloyd at the time. But he's he's not so well remembered anymore. Okay. Um a few others. We've got Student of Prague, which is a Edgar Allan Poe adaptation for Halloween in in October. Okay. And in April, so I do I do so in March, twentieth of March, we have got Prince Ahmed and the last performance, and tenth of April, um, there's a Fritz Lang movie called Woman in the Moon, which is a science fiction movie, and it is the film that invented the concept of the countdown when rockets are launched. They invented it, and NASA copied them. Excellent. Okay, I have a couple of listener questions for you, Ooh. quickly. Exciting. <coughs> the first one is, if you had to choose one, what is Ray's favourite favorite, sorry, silent movie? Oh, God. Um, uh, it could well be Metropolis, or it might be City Lights, okay. uh, which is a Charlie Chaplin film, um, and it is stunning. Um I would say it's one of those two. Between those two, okay. City Lights probably and Metropolis. Metro- probably, probably Metropolis. Probably, yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks for that question. And another question from a listener. Interesting discussion. Are there any other f- film clubs in Lancaster? Is the question that you know of, of course. Um, well, there's about to be one, I believe. Right. Um, at the Gregson also. I'm not sure when, but there's... Um, it's a, it's it's they're going to show it's it, I think it's to raise money for the Labour Party, and they're trying to show sort of films with a kind of socialist. Oh, okay, kind of I might have seen this thing. I think they're showing I Daniel Blake. Okay, great film. Daniel, the yeah. Ken Loach film. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. Ken Loach one, and mm. um, that I'm not sure what else they're going to do. Uh, I don't okay. think that's started yet, but I think it's starting soon. I think I think it's this month or next month. Okay, great. Thanks for now, Ray. <laughs>